Have you ever wanted to travel back in time and see what an old Texas oil town looked like? Then you're in luck. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Gray, director of Spindletop Gladys City Boomtown Museum, located on Lamar University's campus in Beaumont, Texas. We're about to begin a tour and learn how the revolution of oil has fueled our society for over a hundred years. We'll go inside 14 different buildings, including a saloon, living quarters, several businesses, and outside shops to give you a glimpse of an old boom town. I really hope you'll enjoy this presentation, so let's get started. At the Spindletop Gladys City Boomtown Museum, we are a recreation of the boomtown that sprung up after they found oil here in 1901. All of our buildings are copies of buildings that they had back then. In this building, they had the Walkinshaw sheet metal workers, and they would have made the wooden tank that we have example beside of our visitor center, or they would have made galvanized steel tanks. Right here is a 1929 Fagel Brothers oil tanker. This would have carried the oil across the nation. They would have also carried the oil by train and ship. One cool thing about this truck is that there's a crank in the front that they would have had to get out of the truck to start that truck. Behind me is a 1930 Ford Model A, and it belonged to a man named Patillo Higgins. And Patillo Higgins was the person that really thought there was going to be oil under Beaumont. And he set out to find that oil. However, nobody believed him. There was even a person who said that they would have drank every drop of oil west of the Mississippi. Nobody believed him. but. Patilla Higgins was very headstrong and he knew that he was going to find this oil. So he set out, he made his own company, the Gladys City Oil Company. They drilled down, but they didn't have the right equipment. They didn't go down far enough and he loses a lot of money. So he has to leave the company. In the meantime, the company brings in Anthony Lucas, which was a mining engineer from the country of Croatia. But he was going around America looking at salt domes like we had here in Beaumont. And he said, I think Patilla Higgins is right. I think there's something, if not oil, under that salt dome. So he also drilled down. But again, he didn't go down far enough. He also didn't have the right equipment. He was going to give up. But his wife said, honey, we don't have any more money to move. You better go down 1,100 feet like you promised. And when he went down 1,100 feet, that's when the oil came up. And poor Patilla Higgins said, hey, that's my idea, and I should get some of the wealth from that fine. And literally the very next day, he goes down to the courthouse to sue the company. Later that year, he forms another company called the Higgins Oil Company, and he does find oil on his own. Now, he's considered a prophet. People are calling him up on the phone. They want him to come out to their field because they just believe there's oil. There's stories that he actually walks out into the field in Mejia in central Texas. He didn't say a word. He stops and said, there's oil under my feet. When they dug down, there was oil. Now, he didn't tell anybody, not even his own family, about where the oil was. But he buys this car for $745, and he goes around with this car for 25 years, actually, looking at other oil sites. One other cool thing about this car was that he actually only had one arm. Uh, so this was rigged so he can drive it with uh, one arm. Now over here, we have a oil pump that was patented by the inventor in 1901. Uh, so the same year that they found oil in Beaumont, they actually patented the gas pumps. So this is the barber shop. Barber shop is one of my favorite buildings out here at the museum. It has the first picture taken of the oil. You can imagine this oil ran for nine days straight. They lost 800,000 barrels of oil and Beaumont grew from 9,000 to 50,000 people almost overnight. So you can imagine everyone and their mothers coming here trying to capitalize on that oil. There were so many people that came to Beaumont, they actually came to the barber shop and rented the chair to sleep on. Sometimes the barber rented the chair twice, once during the day and once during the night, because there are so many people that came here. Now, all of this oil is getting in the water supply, so it was very difficult to find really good water. In fact, a barrel of good water was $6 a barrel. But because there was so much oil, the price of oil fell from $2 a barrel to $0.03 cents a barrel. So $0.03 cents for oil 
and six dollars for water. Now the people of Boma thought cha-ching, we're gonna make money. So the prices in the corner, those are inflated prices. Everybody raised their prices uh, because they knew all of these people getting off the trains, they had no other place to go, right? And then the most expensive on the list is the hair singe. This was the fashion of the time. They would cut your hair and then they would burn the split ends of your hair to give you a fuller cut. That's why it was more expensive. Your barber was also your dentist. So the other two chairs in here, they are the dentist chairs. So not only did they sleep in here and burn hair, but they also pulled teeth in here. Also over here was the shaving mug case. And the shaving mugs were a very interesting part of the barbers um, because this is how the barbers uh, raised their uh, clientele. Because a person that needed to be shaved, they would go out and find somebody to make their own personalized shaving mug. And then they would keep it at the barber. So this way they would keep coming back to the same barber shop. So we are in the saloons, and saloons popped up all over during the Boomtown era, and that's why the crimes popped up all over. Now up above on the post here it says, please do not spit on the floor. So you can imagine these big burly guys coming here, they're chewing tobacco, they need a place to spit their tobacco. What they would have by the tables are spittoons. So people are chewing tobacco. They would spit in spittoons. In fact, outside it says, boys under 21 do not enter. But I was asked by a young girl, what about girls? So I told her the truth that young girls would never be found in a place like this. However, there was one woman, her name was Carrie Nation, and she went around the country and she would march into the saloons with an ax. She hated the saloons. She hated, thought the saloons were the beginning of all evil. She imagined husbands coming here, taking a drink, and going home and slapping their wives. She just hated the saloons. So she would march in, ax up the tables, ax up the bars, ax up the drinks, trying to close saloons. Now there is a record of her coming to Beaumont, but there's no record of her carrying her ax or closing saloons. But there were other people who did. For example, Patillo Higgins' former boss and later business partner, George Washington Carroll, he came into his saloons with an army. Now, some parts that I didn't tell you about Patillo Higgins, he actually started out on the bad side of life. He was a gang leader. One thing he loved to do with his gang was to start abandoned houses on fire in the rain just to see the fire department get stuck in the mud. But he did harsher things as well. He lost his arm in a gun battle with a police officer. He shot and killed the police officer, but the police officer got a shot off and hit Patillo Higgins in the arm, and he lost his arm. Later, he goes to a religious revival and he finds God and he wipes off anything that caused mischief in his life. But I love old pictures, and this is one of my favorites because you can see the fashion of the time. It looks like it's probably about fall, maybe winter, they're all heavily dressed. But one thing you can see is that all the men are wearing hats. They're standing on this pipe, uh, probably getting ready for it to go down in the ground. But one thing that people miss are these three children here. Back in 1893, about nine years before they found the oil, there was a big economic collapse. And it, in fact, it was called the Great Depression before the Great Depression in 1929. Sometimes at this time in 1901, Children had an easier job to find jobs faster than the father because, first of all, they were cheap. Uh, two, they uh, were just uh, doing things that we couldn't do for uh, getting in places we couldn't go because we were too large. And three, they were expendable. And what expendable means they were easily replaceable. So let's say I was telling my child worker that you needed to go and get a pipe and he was going and he fell and broke his arm. Now I'm gonna be mad, his mother's gonna be sad, but he's not doing anything that requires a lot of training. So I'll just say, well, you go home, I'm gonna hire this child. It wasn't until 1916 that there was a child labor law that said we want our children to go to school and not to work. So that was 15 years after they found the oil. Now we have traveled over to the Guffey Post Office 
Guffy was actually the person that Anthony and Lucas went to find money to do the drilling. Guffy was related to the millionaire Andrew Mellon, so they were the ones that actually gave the money to start drilling for the oil. But in here, you have the true picture of Gladys City. This is what we copied our museum off from. So you can see the wooden walkways, the covered porches, just like we have here at the museum. So down here, we have a picture of all the derricks so close together. In fact, these were put together like puzzle pieces. At one area, you could walk across the derrick floors for about a mile without touching ground. So all of these people are drilling out the same oil. So that's why the first boom only lasted for about five, 10 years before it dried up. There was a second boom in 1926, and that went a little longer. Now over here, we have two windows. One is a money order window. So even today, you can go to CVS or Walgreens and get like a check so that you don't have to send money through the mail. And the other one's the mail window. So at this time, you didn't wait for the mailman to bring your mail to you. You actually went to the mail office to pick up your mail. But what's kind of interesting is that even if you're the only person in the post office and you wanted to get a money order and pick up your mail at the same time, you still had to go to the individual windows because it was against the law to do both things at the same window. So up above the mail window, we have the president of the time. Back then, it was William McKinley. Now, the oil was found in January of 1901, but unfortunately, in September of 1901, William McKinley becomes the third president assassinated. And so right behind me is the picture of his, what's called a funeral frame or memorial picture. So this is the A.L. Gibson's dry goods store. Now, what's really interesting is the post office, the postmaster was also A.L. Gibson. So the dry goods store and the post office were right next to each other. At the dry goods store at that time, you would have bought suits already made or you would have bought the stuff to make your suits. You didn't go into there and everything was already made. Some people, if they were lucky, they brought their families and their wives would have bought the stuff to make their suits. But if you were a lonely oil guy, you would have bought a suit already made, right? And in here has a couple of my favorite objects. Here on the table is what's called a yo-yo quilt. This was a very time intensive quilt to make. You have to make all the little yo-yos and then put, uh, sew them together and make a quilt out of them. But right here is uh, one of my favorites is a, a time clock. And so if you were to uh, assign to use this time clock, your boss would uh, assign you a number. So let's say you were number five, you would take this crank and push it into number five when you entered in the morning. And then uh, that would record your time on the paper in the back. And then uh, of course, when you left, you would do the same thing so that your boss knew when you came in and, and left. What's kind of cool about this clock is it's made by the International Time Recording Company. And what's cool about that is that later this company joins other companies and they form IBM. So this is a precursor to the modern computer company. So up above me are round boxes. And we don't see round boxes like these today, we don't use them, but these are hat boxes. People of all ages, they used hair coverings of some sort. To my right, you can see a hair bonnet for women. Today, we see those up for babies, but back then, even older women would have wore a hair bonnet. And men, they wore crown hats or derby hats. So now we're in the general store. It was also called a weigh and pour store because you weighed it and poured it. Uh, you really bought anything you needed to sustain your life. Behind me, the food. Over here, the farming equipment. Then you bought your dishes and plates. And then in the corner is an old grain separator. So before they found oil in Boma, this area was big on lumber and rice. So you would have taken your rice and taken it to the grain separator and separated it between the good and bad and whatnot. Up above the grain separator are two lanterns. Now, when they first found oil in the United States, it was 1859 in Pennsylvania. And the biggest use of that oil was to light your lanterns. In fact, if you heard the name John Rockefeller, he was the richest American that ever lived. And he made the, all of his riches by selling oil for people's lanterns. When they first found oil here in uh, Boma in 1901, this was at a time when they were choosing between gas power cars and electric power cars. 
And because of the sheer amount of oil that they found here, it really pushed everyone to go to gas power cars. Even ships and trains, they were looking for a cheaper, cleaner source of fuel. They were using whale oil, and whales were dying out, and trains were using coal, and it was dirty and expensive. Because that amount of oil that they found here really pushed ships and trains to change their fuel source as well. This area in Boma, we really did change the world about how they operated their machines and their vehicles, and that all happened here in Boma. So we came upstairs, and this is the living quarters over the general store. And this probably was the family that operated the general store. Now, if this was where you lived, you're probably going to move your family to the living area and rent out your bedrooms. There was actually no place to sleep. We talked about people sleeping in the barber shop. People would knock on doors like here and rent out beds. If you were a lonely oil guy, you probably didn't mind sleeping with a stranger because the uh, alternative was to hop on the train and sleep on the train all the way to Houston and back, or even just falling in the grass and sleeping there. That's how people lived. There was just no room to sleep, right? Now, do you know what the most important thing in your house? For me, it would be the toilet. And so under the beds in the bedrooms, you could see what's called a chamber pot. Back at that time, your father went off to work. Your mom was busy in the kitchen or sewing or whatever. So this was a kid's job. This would be uh, your job to, to clean the chamber pot. Now, the question about the chamber pot also is why would they use that? They would have had their bathroom outside. Of course, they didn't have indoor plumbing, many houses, but they also didn't have electricity. So in order to use the restroom at night, they would have had to use the chamber pot at night because they were too scared to go out there in the dark. So they used the chamber pot and then in the morning, so it was the children's job to empty the chamber pot. Now in the kitchen, you have the ice box. Of course, you would have had to buy the ice to put in the ice box to keep things cold. Beside the ice box is an oven or a stove. I think it's a good diet plant because it's a very skinny stove. And then beside the stove is a bathtub. They would have had to splash themselves. Also in the bedrooms, you had a wash basin and a uh, pitcher. So they would have also used that to wash up as well. And then um, leaning against the cupboard is an old vacuum cleaner. Many people bought this contraption because they thought it would save time. And how you would use it, you would hold the handle on the side and then you would bring the handle up on the top and that would suck in your garbage. So many people thought this was a good thing until they tried to use it. They used it about two or three times and they realized this was more work than just to sweep the garbage uh, into your dustpan. So a lot of these are still in good condition because they just put it in their attic or their garage or whatever. Uh, because it did not save any time. So up here in the living room, you have a couple of interesting inventions that you probably would have asked for for your birthday or Christmas. Up here on the counter, you have what's called a magic lantern. And this was a kind of interesting contraption because you would have bought pictures to go in the slots and then you would have looked in the nose and that would make the pictures 3D. This was kind of uh, important because people didn't travel like uh, we do today. So uh, this is how they got to see pictures and areas from the outside of their uh, city. Now behind me on the organ, you have what's called an Edison Blue Amber Record. And Thomas Edison made this contraption to make music. And uh, you would have bought these cylinders to go on that contraption. And just like how your parents probably bought CDs or uh, records, they would have bought these cylinders to go on this contraption. And each cylinder played two songs but they probably would have had a collection of these cylinders to have different music in their house. Now we're standing in the oil exchange building. The oil exchange is a good time to ask you, what is your nickname? Do you have a nickname, that another name that people call you that's not your real name? Well, Spindletop had a nickname. It was called Swindletop because everyone was swindled out of their money. For example, there was a father that tried to sell his boy as a boy with x-ray eyes. So if you gave them enough money, the boy would look down on the ground to tell you where the oil was. 
There was even um, people up north that couldn't travel down, so they hired people down here to buy land for them. And later, they found that land was actually in the Gulf of Mexico. Kind of good today, but back then they had no idea that there was going to be oil in the Gulf of Mexico. So this building is set up as a multi-use building. In the back is a print shop. In the print shop, they would print off stock certificates. These were papers that said that these companies were real companies that they assigned to the uh, government saying we want to form as a real company. And then in the middle was a law office that would stamp those legal. And then in the front was the oil exchange where they would buy and trade those stock certificates. Now one thing that you have to realize is that there was 600 different companies that formed to look for the oil. Uh, some of these we know today. For example, up here is Guffey Company, uh, Guffey Petroleum. Guffey is uh, a golf oil. And then here is Sunoco, or Sun, Sun Oil. Uh, that became Sunoco. And then uh, Texaco, or Texas Company, formed here as well. And then ExxonMobil didn't form here. They were part of Standard Oil. But they did buy companies that did form here. So when you're going after your gas, you, can, you could probably guess that either they got a, their start in Beaumont, or they got a really big push. A lot of these companies, of course, uh, did not make it. Uh, in fact, a lot of them didn't even get a chance to drill for oil. But one of my favorites is the One Penny Oil Company. I like that because I think I could afford that one. So we are in the Edgerton Photography Studio. That first picture taken of the oil was taken by a man named Frank Tross. He was a photographer down in Port Arthur. When he heard the oil was going off, he grabbed his camera and ran out there to take the picture. In the photography studio, you wouldn't have this many cameras on display, but we had a good supply, so we put it here. Now, the most popular camera at the time would be the Kodak Brownie. You probably would have saved up for your own camera, but the professional photographers did have a really good business as well. So you see some of the bigger cameras was used by them. Now over here on the postcards, you can see two of them are what's called side gushers. And what was happening here, let's say I wanted you to invest in my company, but you wanted to make sure that I was a good company in finding oil. So I would take you out to my derricks and tell my guys, let it blow. And they would show you that I'm finding oil they would have also used side gushers as the trains went by. They would have done a side gusher and then everybody would rush off the train to go to those companies because they could see that this was a good company to invest in. Now some other postcards have examples of fire. Some of these fires would have been started by lightning strikes, the sparks from the trains going by. And so they did have an awful time with fires. In fact, they almost lost everything because of the fires that happened back then. This is the Lambs print shop. So the Lambs were a printing family and went back five generations. And they went all the way back to Spindletop. They gave the local newspaper a really big push. And this was still a business all the way up to the 1980s, 90s. A lot of the bigger companies though, like FedEx and Kinko's, they took away their business. So they eventually closed up shop and brought over their old machinery here. And the printing business was very important. You, know, you were printing off uh, advertisements and a lot of other things. One of my favorite machines is the Linotype. And the Linotype was said by Thomas Edison to be the eighth wonder of the world because it cut down on the number of people and the amount of time it needed to type out a line of type, which is where the name came from, and to put on their printing machines to print off their papers. Before the linotype machine, they couldn't have a, a newspaper longer than eight pages because it just took too much time. Also, after the linotype, literacy rates ran up because they could produce a lot more uh, material. Now in here, you would have a boy uh, young as nine to help out the uh, printers. Uh, they were actually called printing devils. It's said that maybe they play too much tricks but they did learn a very valuable skill as they grew up around the industry. This is the Gladys City Drug Company, and outside there is a sign that says doctor's office and milkshakes. So many people always ask us, why is there milkshakes in the doctor's office? 
If you look, you can see advertisements for Coca-Cola. And did you know Coca-Cola, Dr. Pepper, and Pepsi-Cola? They were made by your pharmacist. And they were made as health drinks. They would uh, put your medicine in there to hide the bitter taste and give it to you as health drink. That's why you would find a soda machine in with a doctor's office. Now, they didn't put medicine in all of your stuff. You could get ice cream and it would be fine. But you can come here and get a good Dr. Pepper and have your medicine in there as well. Doctors, just like everybody else, jumped on the trains uh, because they knew that the oil fields were ready supply of patients. They, it was a very difficult and dangerous job. Some people lost their arms, some people lost their leg. There's even stories of people falling in the oil and drowning. The doctor actually had a 10-year-old boy that would help him out. And when the doctor had to do an amputation or take off a limb, he would send the boy across the street to the butcher shop to borrow the saw to come back to do the amputation. So we probably should be very happy with our doctors today. Now in the back is the doctor's office. In the corner is an old dental x-ray. And then you see the hospital bed, you see the old wooden wheelchair. So there's a lot of really interesting items back there. Some kids say that our doctor's office is spooky. I don't know if it's spooky as much, but today they would hide a lot of their machines and closets, but they didn't have closets back then. So you see everything is out ready for the doctor to get. So this is the Gladys City Oil Company, and the Gladys City Oil Company was the first company formed in Texas to look for oil. And it formed in 1892 by, of course, Patillo Higgins and George Washington Carroll. And the other partner was George Washington O'Brien. And O'Brien was the Civil War captain that camped out at the site during the Civil War. And he heard the gases at night, saw the oil seeping up. So he started to buy the land knowing that that would be a very expensive land when they found the oil. Now, Gladys is Gladys Bingham. You can see uh, Gladys right there. And she was the favorite Sunday school student of Patilla Higgins. Patilla Higgins would take out his Sunday school and they he would do tricks with the oil, burning it in the air, those kind of things. She got two shares of stock and the company and the city were named after her. Now, this map is actually not of a real place. As I said, Patilla Higgins was very determined that he was going to find the oil. So in 1892, when he formed the company, he sat down with a couple map makers to form his ideal oil city. He thought of where people would work, he thought of where people would live, he thought of churches, he thought of hotels, he thought of everything in this map. Now there was a little a bit of a Gladys city before they found the oil, but remember he was outside the company and also people came so fast they could not put this well-designed city together. Now behind me is also a phone People have to realize though, to operate that phone, you would actually have to call the operator. And then just remember that you didn't own your own phone line. You would have to actually share the phone line with your neighbor. So if maybe you were three rings, but only rang twice, that probably was your neighbor's call. So we are in the engineer's building and you can see the real map of what we were looking at. Nelson and White were actually uh, map makers and they made a lot of maps of Jefferson County and this is Southeast Texas. But this is one of the first uh, oil field maps of the world and that was very difficult to do for two reasons. One, land changed hands as small as 1 64th of an acre and this was the size of a derrick floor. So if you bought that land you would have had to rent the land beside you to get your tools on. Also, land changed hands two or three times a day. Uh, so let's say somebody had land that they lived all of their life and they talked to their wife and said, I bet all of these people, somebody would pay $300 for our land, which was a really good amount for that time. So they sold that land for, to somebody for $300 only to find out later that afternoon, those buyers sold that land for $3,000 to somebody else. So that happened and those amounts are actually real amounts. Here you can see surveying equipment because of course they needed that to make their maps. George White was actually a bachelor and he lived in his office. So this is what we call the bachelor pad. And also these are a lot of the real items from Nelson and White. The families gave a lot of the real items. So Nelson and White actually did use a lot of the equipment here.
So this is the blacksmith shop, and the blacksmith shop is one of the more important shops in the oil field, because if you have an idea for a drill, and you would bring it to the blacksmith, and the blacksmith would try to make your drill. Now this again would be another place where a boy as young as nine would work with a blacksmith. One of the first things he would learn to make is a nail. A good apprentice of the blacksmith can make a nail in about 15 seconds. So he would take that nails and they would sell those to make their keep. But in the process, they would learn a very valuable skill that they needed because every place needed a blacksmith. In the back is a place where they would have made the wagon wheels. The anvils actually belong to the original blacksmith, George Shaw, actually started in San Antonio. And one of his bigger customers was Theodore Roosevelt when Roosevelt was getting ready to go to the Spanish-American War. And then when they heard about the oil, they moved from San Antonio here. And this was still a business until about the 70s and 80s. So this is the Broussard's Undertaker and Livery Stable. And the Undertaker is the person that buries you after you die. So in here, we have our coffins. And Broussard's is still a business today. And it's the largest funeral home in Beaumont. And they did get started in a stable. They were renting out the hearses and wagons for funerals. And they said we could get more money by selling the funeral equipment as well. So that's how they got their start here. It was a very dangerous place. People were dying because of crime or they were dying on the oil field. So there were many funerals to take care of. Now over here is a spring wagon. And the spring wagon is kind of important because the first car didn't sell in Beaumont until 1903, two years after they found oil here. And the reason people still went around with their horses and buggies, one, cars were still expensive. It wasn't until Henry Ford came out with the Model T that it was a car for everybody and was cheaper. But also some people really thought that car was very dangerous. Even though it was going 20 miles an hour, which is slow to us today, that was very fast back then, and they thought it was dangerous. And some people actually said that if you buy a car, you might kill a horse, because why would you need horses if you had cars? But again, after Henry Ford came out with the Model T, that's when everyone started to buy a car and it became a little more convenient. All right, on this side of the stable, we have our collection of oil equipment that were actually, a lot of it was used at Spindletop. Now, number one here is the rotary drill. And the rotary drill, they did use a little bit before spindle top, but not very much. They use what's called hook and cable drilling, a lot of hitting on the ground until you get lower. But that didn't work here because there was a lot of quicksand and rock that they couldn't get past. So they brought the rotary drill just to see if it could get past, and it did. And so after spindle top, uh, more oil fields used the rotary drill than they did hook and cable drill. Now the wagon over here without any sides, that was called a dray wagon. And dray means to haul. And they would have taken their poles and pipes from the trains to the oil fields on these, uh, this wagon. And then up above here is a yellow dog derrick lantern. And they called it that because if you light both sides and you looked at it from afar at night, it looked like the yellow eyes from a dog. So that's why they nicknamed it the yellow dog derrick lantern. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed traveling back in time with us and learning a little bit of Southeast Texas rich history. I encourage you to come see the museum in person. Look us up on our social media pages for more information. We're located on Lamar University's campus right off of Highway 69. Just look for the oil derricks. Feel free to share this video. Y'all have a great day and thank you for joining us.